Good evening, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. I'm Hui Shan from Putra Heights Buddhist Society, and I'll be your MC tonight. Welcome to another Friday online Dhamma sharing session on the Breaking Myth series. This series is initiated and organized by Joho Gladian's <laughs> Meta Buddhist Fellowship and is also supported by 16 other Buddhist organizations across the country. Once again, welcome to another Friday night online Dharma sharing on Breaking Myth series. First, I would like to give a brief introduction about the speaker, Dr. Punya Wong. Dr. Punya is currently an associate professor in internal medicine at Monash University, Malaysia, based in Johor Bahru. He has been sharing the Dharma regularly in Malaysia, Singapore, Jakarta, Manila, Ho Chi Minh City, and Bangkok for the last two decades. Let us now invite Dr. Punya for the 18th talk of the series, entitled Dying and Death. Over to you, Dr. Punya. Good evening, Dhamma brothers and sisters. And I wish you a very happy new year, which will be coming very soon. You would have noticed a breath of fresh air today. And in fact, someone commented that we have very nice music. And that's because tonight's sharing is hosted by Putra Heights, by a group of very young, dynamic people and that's why there's a breath of fresh air. Sister Hui Shan is the youngest moderator that we have today. And we are very, very happy to have her with us. We hope she can be with us for some time before she embarks on further studies. For tonight, I'm sharing on the topic of dying and death. And in this present era of COVID-19, whereby every week I hear of friends or friends of friends or relatives of friends that have passed away, this topic becomes very, very relevant. And now it is tough being told that either we ourselves or a loved one is terminally ill. And although death is a certainty, it is a topic that most of us are not comfortable with. But we must know that death is as natural as birth. Death is something that is inevitable as long as we are born. Give me a second, Dhamma family. I just want to make sure that it's not this is. It's not Sharing screen. Okay. All right. So. It is tough being told that either we ourselves are suffering from a terminal illness or a loved one is suffering from a terminal illness. And as I said, mora serta, hora inserta. In Latin, it means death is definite. For every one of us, it's only the time which is variable. So although death is a certainty for every one of us, it is a topic that most of us are not very comfortable with. But as I mentioned earlier, death is actually as natural as birth. Where there is birth, there will inevitably be death. 
So if we are to find out that we are dying, would we not be nicer people? Will we not love more, try something new? But the reality is we all are dying. And in the Dhammapada, the Buddha say that when we realize this, then petty quarrels become unimportant. And what is important becomes important. So with the Buddha Dharma, the Buddha encourages to have five daily recollections. And one of these is the fact that we are of the nature to die and that we cannot avoid death. My wife used to be very upset with me whenever I talk of things like that. But remember, these are recollections that the Buddha said are actually protective recollections. They protect us. And he said, we must recollect this every day, that we are of the nature to grow old, we are the nature to fall sick, we are the nature to die, and all that is what we call mind, dear, delightful, one day we will be separated from them. And then we will live our life quite differently when we are aware of all these. Because it is quite natural for us to live in denial. I had shared this before, that if ever I rub a bottle and a genie comes out, and the genie gives me one wish, my wish will be that everybody knows exactly when they are going to die. Because then they will live their lives quite differently. They will not waste any time and they will use their time or whatever that's left of it meaningfully. Just think for a moment, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. If you and I now know exactly when you and I will die, five years, six months, and three days from now. Will we not use that five years, six months, and three days very, very well? Point is we don't know. It could be tomorrow, it could be 10 years, it could be 20 years. Now, even when told that someone has a terminal illness, we can still find meaning in life. Because when we cannot change a situation, and we have to change ourselves. And remember the teaching of the Buddha, that happiness and peace of mind is internal. And the Buddha had taught us that there are two arrows. First arrow, the arrow of physical illness, physical pain, which is inevitable. Dukkha, dukkha. Every one of us will have this. But the second arrow, mental pain, that is optional. That suffering we can avoid if we are well trained. After all, life is a terminal illness with 100% mortality. And do not forget, good health is merely the slowest way to die. Harsh realities, but they are the truth. And while doctors play a very important role in the care of the terminally ill, the family, the spouse has a big responsibility to provide round the clock care. And of course, this comes with many, many sacrifices. So I beg of every one of us now in this audience, all 330 listening live, let us be responsible people. Let us prepare prepare an advanced medical directive now so that our children, our spouse, our friends and our doctors know exactly what we want. And I've sent an example of an advanced medical directive along and I noticed that it has been tacked along the, the poster. So you can download an example the one that I sent, or you can download another one from the internet as you like. But an advanced medical directive is important because it tells your spouse who may be too upset at that point of time to follow it. So it's better to let your children have it or your friends, your Kalyanamitas keep a copy 
and of course, if possible, your doctor. Death, as I said, is inevitable. Modern medicine has enabled us to live longer. You know, when Malaya was independent in the 1950s, the late 50s, the average lifespan of a Malayan was only around 60 years old. That is why you are allowed to withdraw your EPF at 55, because in about five to 10 years, you'll be dead. Now, of course, we live longer. The average Malaysian man lives to about 74, 75. The average Malaysian woman about 80 to 83. So technology is even available now to provide life support. And so one has to be very clear to children, spouse, and attending doctors, what exactly you want. Now, after a diagnosis and being told of a diagnosis, things will likely be chaotic. Of course, it is good if we are in control, but it is okay not to be in control. After all, not many people have practiced and everyone's journey towards death is different. So you cannot compare one person to another. But the overriding principle is still the same. And that is we do our best with Meta Karuna. And sometimes relatives, friends say that I do not know what to say. Well, again, nobody attends a course on what to say, but what we can do beyond comforting words is even though you may be quiet, is to stand with the loved one who is sick and provide your presence. Now, there are various timelines in how a person dies. It can be a sudden death, for example, in an accident. This is the one where family and relatives will find it exceedingly difficult to accept. And similarly, now with COVID-19, I've personally known of friends, close friends who died. It was rather rapid within a week or so. And it was really very difficult for the spouse to accept. And then, of course, there are people with terminal illness like cancer, some of which are quite rapid, like cancer of the pancreas, around three to six months. Or it could be an organ failure, like kidney failure, whereby they go on dialysis and drag on for a long time. Or it can be the ravages of diabetes, whereby the patient becomes progressively more frail and finally dies. In these two, it's easier for the family and for the patient to accept it. So everyone is different. You cannot have a one formula which fits all. And the most difficult to accept is that sometimes it is not the old who leave us. There are many a times where it is the young who leave us. And if you look at a thunderstorm, you will find that most of the leaves that fall are old, withered, brown leaves. But among them will be some young, green leaves. That's nature. And we have to remind ourselves that we are actually part of nature. So sometimes it is the young who will depart. And of course, that is difficult because there is a loss of what we call promise, a loss of potential. Dr. Kuba Ross, almost half a century ago, analyzed and gave us that everyone and family members and friends being told of impending death will go through this process psychologically. First, there's denial. No, la, can't be true. La. I want a second opinion. Cannot be. We all understand this. And then there's anger. Very common. Anger at a doctor, a stupid doctor, like how can a talking rubbish, a talking nonsense? And this is where medical 
practitioners get the brunt of it. Relatives come bang table and all kinds of things. And after that, you go into this phase, which can be interchangeable, sometimes depression, sometimes bargaining. Bargaining is common. I see it all the time. People will say, oh, maybe if I drink this holy water, I'll be okay. Or maybe if I go to see this Chinese sensei, I'll be okay. Or maybe if I go to China, I will be okay. We hear this endlessly. Or somebody tell me if I drink that don't know what leaf, I will be okay. Only to end up with depression. As I say, this can be either this comes first or this comes first. Right? Because then they see the reality of failure. And finally, acceptance. But family, relatives, friends, patients, accept reality. So for those who are taking care and for those who are sick, we have to understand this process. And of course, as I said, this is fluid and not fixed. For Kayana meters, those of us who are at the site trying to help, we too have to understand. Anyone who has a family member that is lost will see this process, which Dr. Kuba Ross so elegantly analyzed and put out for us. Some people, this or this or any of the phase can be very long. Some people do not go over depression for a long time. While for some, it is a relatively quick process. But whatever it is, when you understand this, you will understand why patients behave like that. For me, as a doctor, as I said, this is something we see all the time. And so we have to understand, oh yes, you can see the BOMO. Oh yes, you can see that medium, but please don't stop your medicine. Continue taking it. But yes, yes, of course you can see the BOMO. All right, because we understand. They're still in that phase. And of course we must never destroy hope because hope is what gives people strength. And even that hope will change as the timeline changes. At first, there will be denial. There will be hope for a cure. And then of course, as I mentioned, there's hope that whatever the treatment, traditional, conventional, unconventional, modern, ancient, People bargain that if I go do this, I will be okay. And finally, when things appear clearer, then there's hope for prolonging of life. And finally, hope for a peaceful death. So I think for almost all of us in this audience, we have to realize that every one of us will go through this process. And it will be good that we understand this process. Now, we have to respect each other's decision. The patient should be allowed to decide how and where they want to transit. Here, culture makes a big difference. In a Western culture, Patients have the right to know exactly what is going on and they have the right to know and the right to decide. In our culture, it's slightly different. Many a times, the patients, the loved one, the wife, the spouse will say, oh doctor, please don't let my mother know. Please, we don't want her to suffer or she can't take it, whatever. And we have to adapt certain things to our culture because there is no right or wrong. Many of you will know that there were famous people in recent history who were very ill and who died from terminal illnesses. And their whole country knew about it. But in Asian culture, they themselves were not told. In the Western culture, it would be completely unacceptable the patient must be told. So these are cultural differences. But whatever it is, I think that the patient should be given that opportunity to decide how and where they want to transit. 
They may want to opt to stay in hospital with round-the-clock care. And of course, this will be very costly in this time and age. Or they may wish to depart from home with a little time left. Whatever their decision is, we should respect it because it is time well spent. Of course, now there's the other option where some patients choose, and that is to transit in a hospice. That is another option which is available. A good transit is possible. Modern medicine is such that dying in a comfortable way is almost always possible. And here I want to introduce a concept to you all. Death is an event. Death is a moment in time. Dying is a process. The dying process can take one day, two days, one week, or even longer. Now, doctors are under tremendous pressure to prolong life. But every one of us must very honestly ask, the patient, the family, the dependents, the spouse, and the doctor, are we prolonging life with quality or are we prolonging the dying process with needless suffering? If we are prolonging the dying process, something is wrong. All right. Now, last week, someone asked about what I'm going to talk about now. Now, in medical school, doctors are taught about living, prolonging life. Doctors are not taught about dying. And I have actually raised this concern that our medical students should also be taught about dying. Because death is not failure. In many a times, death is letting go. Now, last week, someone posted a written question. Is an advanced medical directive in Malaysia legal? The short answer is yes. And I've given you the answer here, underlined in red, local answer. You can fill up an advanced medical directive stating precisely what you would want should you be terminally ill, should you need to be ventilated, etc. You can even specify what sort of funeral, cremation, burial, how long is the wait, down to what food you want to serve. However, there is no written legal law in Malaysia on this area. We are still behind time as far as this is concerned. And I checked with legal friends. They say not only is there no written law, there is also, not the, there is also no precedence in court case. That means no judge had passed any judgment on this. So it is now up to the patient or the terminally ill person who write this and then his family to respect and honor it. And of course the doctor. Now in the Malaysian Medical Council code, there's a code of ethics an advanced medical directive is clearly recognized. And I have mentioned this in passing yesterday, uh, last week too, that no one can force medical treatment on any person who has validly refused because that would be considered assault. And as noted in the posting for you to download the point that you have to realize is that for the majority of people, at the time where you need this, you are not in a state that is competent enough to tell the doctor that this is what I want. So you have to write this AMD now when you are fully coherent, 
rational and logical and get it witnessed and keep it with your children or your lawyer or your doctor or your kayanamitas because they will be the ones who will have to raise this up at the time where you need it. Now, most doctors will respect this. So a wise doctor will not go on treating dying people beyond the point at which it provides benefit. And you have people with parents in this very audience now who had seen very wise doctors who gave very good advice because they know that we are only prolonging the dying process and not life. So patients near the end of their lives should only receive comfort care. We want them to go in peace and comfort. And doctors should revert to the traditional role of amicus mortis. And amicus mortis is Latin for a friend at death. That means the doctor helps the person transit in the most peaceful, calm, comfortable way possible. Now, the first principle of medicine, as I had mentioned, not a few times, but many times, is first do no harm. The first precept that we all took just now says the same thing. And I had also mentioned this many a times. Anati pata veramani sika padang samadhyami. Pali grammar context is like Malay. It is not brown table. It is table brown. Major hitam, major kuning, major hijau. It's the other way around. So panati pata, the word apana or vata, same as anapanasati. Breeding. Apana literally means breeding things. All right? Atipata means to injure or to harm. The first precept literally tells us do not harm any beings which have breeding. So that principle applies. Whatever we do, we have no wish to harm, but only to help. Now, grieving is a process which is inevitable as long as you're an unenlightened being who still sees life as birth and death as definite points in time. It is only a fully enlightened being who sees beyond, who understands that birth and death is not two finite points in time, but just two points in time of a cyclical process. So it is okay to grieve, but do so as a family, or in this nuclear age where the family is scattered all over the world, then with Kayana meters. I hope we realize how important Kayana meters are nowadays, because family is scattered all over. I posted in Facebook today, that the last time I had a face-to-face -face contact with a family member is so long ago that I cannot even tell with certainty exactly when it is. That is the modern 21st century now. The world is afflicted by death and decay, but the wise do not grieve because they realize the nature of the world. They see reality. They know. Now, grief is not a disorder or a disease or a sign of weakness. It is the price we pay for love. It is the price we pay for attachment. As long as we have attachment, then you are going to have grieving. Now, this is the grief in red that all of us will go through when a loved one departs. Notice this circle and this circle is the same in size. When we lose someone, grief 
encompasses our whole world. We are watching like that. This is the only thing that we see. With acceptance, grief remains, but our world has become bigger. So for those of us here who have lost loved ones, that pain is with us, but our world have become bigger. And this is where family, friends, kyanometers play a very, very important part. And this is Dr. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Kubaros that I mentioned. Now, if you look within Buddhist literature, you will see this that I just mentioned being applied in the famous story of Kisabutami, which you are all familiar with, how she lost her only son and ran around desperately searching for a magic miraculous cure to bring her dead son to life. And the Buddha told her, to look for a mustard seed from any house that had not had any death. And she went around and of course, from every house she learned that there is no family, no household, which had not seen death. And she developed letting go of the attachment, accepting reality. This is the process that she went through. Now, brothers and sisters, in question time afterwards, please do not ask me questions about the afterlife because I'm not bothered at all about the afterlife. I'm more concerned about the present life because the present life will take care of the afterlife. And the real question is not whether life exists after death. The real question is whether we had lived well before death and again the purpose of buddhism is not to convert people but to give people tools to be happier so when dealing with a sick person either ourselves or a relative or a loved one make the sick room a temple tensions will rise especially when the patient is going through a painful phase. Many years ago, I attended to a lady in her 30s, early 30s, with cancer of the pancreas. Cancer of the pancreas is one of the most horrendously painful cancers that anyone can have. And her mother took care of her. So for a week, she went through the dying process. She was maintained on intravenous morphine, which she titrated herself to maintain pain-free intervals. And at the end of the week, she passed away in her sleep. And her mother came out of the room, held my hands and said, I am so glad that she has passed away. She is no more in pain now. So you can see mother had gone through that whole process that I described to you as taught by Dr. Robert, uh, Dr. Ross, Kuba Ross, and she has accepted. And mother had seen Dukkha. So make a peaceful ambience at home, it is easy. In a hospice, it is a bit difficult. And in a hospital, very difficult. And that's why many people, knowing they are terminally ill, will choose to die at home. I had given many talks similar to this in Singapore. And in Singapore, the hospice are quite well developed. And when the hospice workers realize that a person is going to die, let's say in the next 24, 48 hours, they actually move that patient into a single private setting whereby the relatives can do what I had proposed here. And I thought that was very, very good. 
We have to give the family and the dying person abundant love. Remember, I say even the family, for those of us who are Kayana meters, the immediate family also needs metta. It's not just the dying patient. Many of you in the audience are DDs, Dhamma Dutta workers. But DD also means death with dignity. And this is what we want to achieve. When we know, Dr. Quack, my dear brother, that someone is terminally ill, the last thing we want is to have a CV line, an intubated patient, and tubes in the chest, in the abdomen, and everywhere. The last thing we want is that. What we will want would be terminal sedation, terminal sedation to give the patient comfort and pain relief on demand. So we have to learn to let go, both the patient and the family. But these are the words that people need to hear and what we need to say. I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, I love you. Words that need to be said, seek closure, and of course, high time to resolve conflicts and unfinished business. And these are things that no university course teaches. This we have to learn in Dhamma class. My late father went through the dying process and I was glad that my oldest daughter who was there then could do this for us because even I found it difficult. We need to show our love through touch and words. Is there anything you want to talk about? Is there anything you want me to take care of? Follow the lead of the patient. Now with modern technology, with the iPad, show the patient the wonderful things that he did in the past. Surround him, as I said, with spiritual comfort. Imagery, familiar chanting, notice the word familiar, suttas, visits by Kayana meters, arranged visits by venerables so that he can take refuge, take five precepts, make offerings, and of course, seek forgiveness from family and friends. And one of the things we always do at the funeral service is the ceremony of seeking forgiveness and giving forgiveness. And of course, very important again in the modern era, do not allow the patient who is dying to be even more psychologically traumatized by people who comes evangelizing. In Singapore, this is clear. You do it, you get into serious legal trouble. And Singapore General Hospital even have signed boards warning people, please respect each other's religion. And I had appealed in a previous talk, I said maybe TBCM could do it, make little cards. You won't be the first because these cards are already available, telling people I am whatever, please respect my spiritual beliefs, please respect me. Now we have to know, even as lay people, the changes near death that we will expect. Of course, excessive sleep, lower body temperature, confusion, disorientation, color changes, and of course, these are things which can be distressing. Difficulty breathing. Now with the oxygen concentrator, even at home, it is easy. It's reasonably uh, inexpensive to rent. So gone are the days where the poor family have to keep on filling tanks and tanks of oxygen. Pain, as I said, can be relieved quite effectively now with modern medicine. Sometimes we use fentanyl patches for patients who go home. They are transdermal, they're stuck like go York, which give pain relief. And of course, if you do not give enough sedation, if you do not dry the secretions well enough, patients will become very restless, etc. 
But all that can be addressed if you have a good doctor who is an amicus mortis, a friend at death. And finally, giving permission for the dying person to die. You may say this is difficult. It is important. I do not deny it is difficult. As I said, even I had great difficulty when my father was dying to say it. My oldest daughter who rushed to the scene, she said it for us. Brother Ju Singh managed to say it to his late father. And I even have a non-Buddhist friend, good friend, whose relative was dying from cancer in severe distress. And this non-Buddhist friend took this advice and gave permission for the relative to pass on. And then he reported to me that the relative passed on peacefully after. So it is important when the body is broken, when they are suffering in a shattered body, it is important for us to separate your image of a loved one from this shell of a body diseased and broken. This shell is far from the beautiful being that you had known and loved. Give him permission to be free. As I said, no university course or diploma course teaches this. Something like, we are all here with you. We are taking care of you. We will be okay. It is okay for you to go. Now, all these words are, of course, words of reassurance that the ones that he or she love are okay. Because being reassured that loved ones will fare well helps people transit peacefully. And don't wait until the last minute because sometimes it's too late. And in surveys, one of the most common regrets is that people did not manage to say until it is too late. Now, dying people want to hear four very specific messages. Please forgive me, or I forgive you. Thank you, I love you. Reassure the dying person that you understand and are ready. Grant the person permission to set aside the troubles of this world and to transit. Now, sometimes the person may ask you directly, Am I dying? And instead of a yes and no answer, you can reflect the question back by saying, I am not sure or I don't know. How are you feeling? And sometimes relatives also cannot let go, cannot give permission. So you can say, you look tired, rest. Please don't worry about us. If you need to sleep, if you need to rest, it is okay. I understand what is happening and it makes me sad, but we'll be all right. Rest, close your eyes, sleep. Remind him of the Dhamma. Now here I'm going to break some myths and this has gotten me into big trouble at many centers, but I'm going to say it because it's the truth which you can verify yourself. In the Nikayas, in the Pali Canon, are suttas, which records visits by venerables to the bedside of unenlightened lay persons at their dying moments. Now, if you look at these records, the venerables who go there will help the ill person recall their virtuous acts, recall their generosity, their deeds of good things. Recall the Buddha Dharma Sangha. Recall how well they had kept their precepts and how they had learned the Dhamma. This is in the canon, which you can read yourself. Please note that the chanting of the factors of enlightenment, the Bojanga Sutta, to unenlightened people is not found in the Nikayas. There are three instances recorded where the factors of enlightenment, the Bojanga Sutta, was chanted. And in all the three circumstances, the three ill people were 
Arahant, who understood clearly what these factors of enlightenment meant. So this is in contrary to the common practice of Kayana meters visiting and then just chanting the Bojanga Sutta to someone who might have never heard the Sutta before nor understand the words. I think that we should do better with sharing, as I noted earlier, the wholesome things they had done, the words, the deeds, the support of the Dhamma, the Buddha, the Sangha, the keeping of the precepts and their understanding of the Dhamma. Now death can be a moment of extraordinary spiritual opportunity. Do you know that the mind can even be the clearest it has ever been at the moment where a person is about to die? And again in the Pali Canon, in the Nikayas, are records of people getting enlightened at the dying process when they see the realities of life head on. Now we know, brothers and sisters, that the sense of hearing is one of the last, if not the last, to fade away in the dying process. So the words that we say at this time is a crucially important. Now after the funeral, we can say these same words at home. And if conditions are appropriate, the deceased person may even be able to hear us. And because we are not omniscient, we do not know whether or not they have heard or understood or is reborn. So there is no harm to repeat this for a few weeks. Brothers and sisters, I am now going to request that you all close your eyes for the next minute and imagine that you are lying on your deathbed. And I'm going to speak to you gently to your ear. I want you to listen carefully to the words. So please close your eyes and just use your ears to listen carefully now. Imagine that you are lying on your deathbed. Dear brother, dear sister, we are here with you, your Kayanamitas, your family, your loved ones. Know that we care for and love you very much. Let us pay homage to the Buddha. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa buddhang saranang gachami dhammang saranang gachami sangang saranang gachami You have taken refuge, dear brother, dear sister, in the Buddha your foremost refuge, the greatest of jewels. You have taken refuge in the Dhamma, the greatest of medicines. You had taken refuge in the noble Sangha, the best field of merits. You had supported them well. By the power of these truths, may you have peace of mind and comfort of body. To life's end and until final emancipation, you have no other refuge but the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. You have been generous and kept your precepts. Your wholesome karma is ever with you, and your guardian devas will accompany you. Life after life, may you have the conditions and the teachers to help you walk this noble path. Until you reach Nibbana, may you never be far from the Triple Gem. By this truth, may you be blessed always. Brother, sister, may your confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha free you from delusion, attachment and clinging giving you peace and calmness instead. 
May you be free from all pain and discomfort. May you be free from mental distress and fears. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Please open your eyes now. All right. Now for all of us, let us prepare early for the only uncertainty is the hour of death. As I say, it is mora certa, hora incerta. Death is certain. Only the hour is uncertain. Make sure that your family and loved ones will be okay without you. The financial considerations. It is important to think about finances when we or a loved one is gone. If the person is the breadwinner, then we have to ensure that this is taken into consideration and that either the finances are supplied or someone can help out. Consult a lawyer now, make arrangements for the estate and prepare a will. In this time of pandemic, please do it. Within my own medical circle, this preparing a will thing has been going around and around and even formats and templates have been going around within our medical circles asking the doctors, you do not know when, please write it now. Be prepared to pay estate taxes, fees and charges and it may even be helpful to transfer titles to spouse and children in the face of impending death. Save them trouble. Check all your insurance policies. There may be updates needed on the beneficiaries of the policies. You may be entitled to additional claims during this time that may help you pay the medical costs. Or you may want to take a loan out of the total estate in the insurance to help with expenses. So it would be good to have a good Dhamma brother or sister who is in the insurance industry giving you advice. And for those of us who have worked, research employer or government benefits, example, EPF, SOXO. Sometimes we are not aware that EPF or SOXO may have certain benefits for illnesses and hospitalization. And finally, decide early, write it down clearly in your advanced medical directive, what sort of weight or funeral service do you want? Be prepared for the cost, whatever it is. Do you want cremation? Do you want burial? Do you want a modern service? Or do you want a traditional service? All that has to be decided. This picture you see is of course in Singapore at the funeral home, Lavender Funeral Home, where a dear brother passed away and we conducted a very modern contemporary Buddhist service for the brother. Overspending is very, very common because at that time of emotion, people lose judgment. On the spot decisions, sometimes are bad. And I have seen people being literally taken for a ride. For example, I've seen a widow being advised by the undertaker, oh, you should embalm the body. Why, the widow said. After all, we are going to cremate him in just, what, two days time? And the person said, oh, that's because if we don't embalm, he will not look so nice. And the widow, of course, at that point in time, say, oh, yes, 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 do it. Which to me, as a person listening on, is preposterous. You do not need to embalm if you are going to bury or cremate in two or three days. Dry eyes is just as good. And of course, nobody goes window shopping during that time. So for those of us in Johor Bahru, for example, we have a funeral and home provider, an undertaker that have known us so well that some of us call the undertaker by first name. 
And so we make sure he doesn't bully any of our Dhamma brothers and sisters. And it had reached a point after these years that when they phone up and they say, oh, Dr. Wong's friend, then they say, oh, okay, I know what to do already. Everything don't want one, very simple one. Well, that is precisely what we want. All right. So this, of course, is Uncle So's late mother, the funeral service that I conducted. And they opted for a cremation, which is fine. And that is probably, I think, the greenest way in this time and age. And what about the obituary? Nowadays, you can use the internet and it's free. Or you can still use the traditional newspaper, which will cost a fair bit of money. And so this was my late father's obituary, which I did through the internet. And finally, of course, memorial services, sharing merits. Typically, the Chinese will do it on first seven, second seven, third seven, etc., which is fine. After all, it is just a memorial service. And this was at the Buddhist Mahavihara at Brickfields. So Dhamma family, brothers and sisters, I want to thank you. I hope that on the last week of this year, this sharing has helped us in the midst of this pandemic to learn a little bit on how to deal with a topic that nobody wants to talk about. But I think it's important to talk about because no one, none of us will ever stay forever. So we should be prepared. With this, I thank every one of you. And I wish that you had learned something from this. And I will now pass over to my host, Hui Shan. Thank you, Dr. Punya, for the insightful Dharma sharing. Next on, we will move to the Q&A session. For those who have any questions for Dr. Punya, please post your questions in the comment section and I'll read out your question. First up, we have a question from Lim Kota. Sir, kindly share your thoughts and advice on how to console and what's wise to say to the aggrieved family members. Right. Dear brother. Well, as I said, first and foremost, every one of us will go through a different process. And so there is no one formula fits all. We have to be very receptive to the situation in hand. And as I said, I showed you earlier different manners in which people pass away. Sometimes people pass away very suddenly, in which case it is actually very, very difficult. They would have closed their ears. No matter what we say, it's unlikely to make much of a difference because the person is literally in shock. While well, for those who took time, then it is much easier. That means the person had a time process or a ill period that is a few months, then it is easier for the family to accept. So first and foremost, there is no one single formula. Second is the background. And again, people are all different. Here, of course, we are speaking to a community who is all presumably within the Buddhist community, we would have learned some foundations of the Buddha Dharma. And here, of course, our consolation will be using what is in the Buddha Dharma. For example, someone who has got a chronic illness and then passed away or someone elderly passed away, I would often say that, you know, dear brother and sister, that of course we are very sad and we should have this grieving process, but realize that birth and death is actually two sides of the same coin. And where there is death, there will be birth. Where there is death, there will be continuation. And your dearly departed had been such a wonderful Dhamma brother or sister that 
his or her karma will surely assure that the person's journey will continue in a very wholesome manner. For us, we do not have to grieve. For us, we rejoice in a life that is so well led. We rejoice that we had so many years of this person's love and wisdom. So, you know, one of the things that we do is actually light candles along the way for those who would like to have rituals in the funeral service and say, we say goodbye to this person. So as I said, there is no one single formula, brother. We will have to look at the situation. Another situation, of course, was the sudden death that we had within one of the Dhamma brothers. And when I walked into the funeral, the father walked to me, hugged me, and cried. What can you say to a sudden death of a child in a situation like that? There is no words which I can say which can console. So the only thing I can do is to hug him back and let him cry. Because there we are standing, giving our physical, emotional support by our mere presence. So that is why another thing I always say is, some Dharma family members say, oh, I don't know what to say, like Dr. Wong, when I go for the wake. And I say, no, you don't have to say anything. Just go and show your presence. Go and show your love. And, you know, during the time, during the family's wake and, kala and, and funeral, everything is kalam kabut. So we try our best to help them. For example, sometimes we buy food, we buy kueh bahulu, we buy drinks and bring it up and say, here, these are cakes that we bought for your guests and all that. And that's because people are so kalam kabut, they have no idea what to do. And of course, Dhamma brothers and sisters here try their best to help arrange for venerables to come fetch the venerables. All these are emotional support because the family at that time, especially if it's a sudden death, is literally stunned. The best, of course, is to be prepared now. And that is why I'm sharing this talk. Back to you, Huishan. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Uh, next, we have a question from BGF from Su Yi Lu. Dear Dr. Wong, yesterday I attended the funeral service of a 95 years old Aussie woman. She has got not religion and does not expect to go to heaven or to be reborn. In her last will, she insisted of using the cheapest cardboard casket for cremation. Also in her last will, she donated half of deceased estate to animal welfare and half to her only daughter. From the Dharma standpoint, can her effort be even more supreme? Your comment, please. Thank you. Dear <laughs> Sister Su Yi, I, I imagine it's a sister. Now, Sister Su Yi, when one of us or any one of us here die, what we state in our Malaysian IC card as our religion makes absolutely zero difference. No difference. Whether you taro on your head, I'm a Christian, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Theravada Buddhist, I'm a Mahayana Buddhist, I'm a Vajrayana Buddhist, I'm a Hahayana Buddhist, because I follow Dr. Wong, makes no difference. The only difference is what you and I do. Isn't that what the Buddha taught? It's your karma. And karma is not something magical. Huh? Karma is merely what we do intentionally. Nothing magic in karma. I always say if I drop this mouse and it breaks, oh, that's karma. There's nothing magic. Please don't put magic into karma. If I drop this cup or if I mindlessly put hot water here and drink it and burn my tongue and my mouth, that's karma. That's because that's something I did. So it is not what we call religion. It is not whether you and I believe, you and I can believe in heaven and hell, or you and I refuse to believe in heaven and hell. You and I can believe in rebirth or say no such thing. Does it make a difference? Does it make a difference? What you believe is not going to make any difference. So as far as this 95 years old Aussie lady is concerned, to me, I'm not concerned whether she has got a religion or not. I'm actually, frankly, not concerned whether Hui Shan's boyfriend is Buddhist, Christian, Hindu, Muslim, whatever, as long as Hui Shan's boyfriend is a good person. All right? So what we call as religion is what we put as labels. And religious labels actually have no meaning because when a person dies, that label doesn't follow. 
So whether she believes in heaven or hell makes no difference. And in her will, she insisted on the cheapest cardboard casket for her cremation. And I applaud. Remember that brother I showed you in Singapore funeral house at Lavender Funeral Home? He insisted on plywood. He was one of my great Dhamma supporters. He used to tell me when he was in good health, he was sick for many years. Whenever I go and share, he would push money onto me and he said, Dr. Wong, use this for Dhamma sharing. I said, no, 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 I don't need it. He said, yeah, I know you don't need it, but I need to do it. So please accept it and use it for your Dhamma sharing activities. Fine. Because he wanted to do Dana. He wanted to do Dhamma Dutta work, but he can't. So at least he said, let me support. So he too insisted on the plywood. He said six pieces of plywood. And so, well, to be frank, this was the first coffin that I saw with my own eyes, which is literally six pieces of plywood. So she chose the cheapest bought casket for cremation and I applaud her. And in her last will, she donated half of her deceased estate to animal welfare. That tells me this lady has compassion. This lady has meta and it is unconditional. It's not my dog. It's any dog, any cat. And half of course to her only daughter. From her Dhamma field, from the Dhamma standpoint, of course, I do not know what she did with the rest of her life, and so I can't comment. But from what little information I know, I will say, this lady, well done. All right, so I hope that's clear. Next question, Prishan. Uh, next up, we have a question from BGF also, from Felicia Tai. Um, I would like to die on my bed, but my daughter is scared. Dr. Wang, your advice, please. And a follow-up question is, during the last few days, can we play chanting tapes for the dying to listen? Dear Sister Felicia, I too would like to die on my bed if that is possible. So we share the same wish. Okay? There is nothing to be scared, tell your sister, your daughter. And I'll tell you something funny here to break the tension, Sister Felicia, it is getting very serious. So I was in Singapore at a forum along these lines, public forum, huh? so big audience, many, many different religions. So I mentioned about this dying at home, dying in my own familiar surrounding, dying where I can have the imagery that I am so familiar with, because I said that would give me comfort. And you know, many, many people in Singapore live in HDB. I can't tell you the exact percentage, but it's a very high percentage. So someone in the audience raised their hand and said, no, Dr. Wong, I would not like to die in my HDB flat. I want to die in a the hospice. Then I reply, why would not your own flat be much more a, a surrounding that is familiar to you? And the person replied, no, 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 Dr. Wong. If we die in our HDB flat, the resale value will drop. So I must die in a hospice. Now that's very practical. And of course, everybody had a good laugh, but the reality is this sister Felicia. We want to die with a mind that is calm and at peace. That is important because every step conditions the next step. Now you have listened to my sharing for one hour plus. It has conditioned your next one week, one month, maybe even one year, or maybe even the rest of your life. So everything conditions the next. Well, this is what cause, condition, and effect is all about. So. I would like to die in my own house, in my own room, in my own bed, surrounded by the imagery that I see for the donkey years, because this is something that I know will give me peace of mind, calmness. An unfamiliar environment is not going to allow that. And that is why for so many of us, when we go and stay in a hotel, we can't sleep because it's a very unfamiliar environment. So if you tell your daughter this, I am sure your daughter will understand. And there is nothing to be scared. Of course, if she say, I don't know what to do, then she may need help, either professional or from Kayanamitas, but she will need help. And maybe afterwards I'll ask a brother to share how they got professional help to take care of the father for at least one to two months. So that is, there are ways in which you can overcome it. But of course, as I said, every family is different. Some families really have no choice but to place 
the person in the hospice or in a palliative care ward. But to me, if given a choice, I think we should revert to the old days whereby we die in a familiar environment. All right, thank you. Our next question from Hai Eng Oh, sorry, sorry, I have not answered that part about the tapes, right? Oh, yes, of course you can. Nowadays, uh, no more tapes, huh? Sister Felicia, now it's CDs. Huh? And I'm told by my students, no more CDs, Dr. Wong, they tell me. Uh, nowadays, our computers don't have CDs. They only have thumb drives. And then another one come and tell me, Dr. Wong, now my Mac doesn't have a thumb drive. It has a type C drive. So whatever it is, it is the mechanism for which you play chants or hymns that the person is familiar with. Okay, because what's the point? The point is to make the person remember wholesome things. All right, you want the mind to have peace. You want the mind to recall wholesome things and we associate. Because of long association, the instant you hear Namo Tassa, oh, we think of the Buddha. The instant we hear Budang Saranang Gachami, we think of the triple gems, long association. So if you are Mahayana Buddhist, the instant you hear again you think on these things that we associate to be wholesome. So yes, playing tapes, if you still have a tape recorder or CD or on a thumb drive, is fine. All right? Sorry, Hishan. Thank you, Dr. Punya. Uh, next question from Hai Eng Wei from BGF also. Do you agree abortion ought to be allowed for rape victims? Imagine bearing and raising a child of a rapist or rapist. The suffering trauma for her and her family members. Okay. Hi, Ing. Sorry, I can't identify whether you're brother or sister. Um, I'm going to give you the answer that was raised. I attended a medical conference in Singapore at least I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, a Buddhist medical conference, at least 15, 20 years ago. And it was around this topic. It was organized by a major Mahayana Buddhist group. Because I don't have their permission, I will not mention their name, but it was organized by a major Mahayana Buddhist group. So it was a day long conference. And so I was part of the panel. And so we talked, talked, talked. At the end of the day, the abbot, or the founder of the, the order happened to transit in Singapore on the flight somewhere. And he was so kind that he took that transit to come to the conference hall to meet us, lowly people like me. And so when he came unannounced, everybody was shocked because he was a giant in the world of Buddhism. And so all, all of us went to the front as he came in, waiting to prostrate, etc. as he walked in, he walked straight to us, stuck his hand out, shook our hands and said, thank you so much for spending your time to help us with this conference. First thing which struck me, amazing. To me, it was amazing. He didn't want us to do any prostration, nothing. He shook our hands, greeted us warmly, like truly a brother. And then, of course, we invited him on stage. And this was the question which was raised. This same question, brother or sister Hai Eng, was raised. And so I will paraphrase this great abbot's answer. I'm paraphrasing, of course. It's not the exact words. And remember, this was 15, 20 years ago when he was much more conservative. Basically, his reply is this. He said, first, we are Buddhists. We are Buddhists. We only want the best. Second, Buddhism gives you tools to be happy. Third, do not judge. Do not judge, he said. And then he said, you know, just before I left my home country, there was something like that. Someone broke into a house. Tied the father mother up. Unfortunately, raped the teenage girl burglars. Then they left. The father, the mother, the child are devout followers of his center. And so after everything was settled, they came and they sought his advice. 
and they asked him, Dear yeah, Venerable, what are we to do now? First thing he said is, yes, I'm so sorry this has happened. This is truly a tragedy beyond words. Pain that no one can describe. Pain that no one can understand unless you are there, he said. Yes, he said, the Buddhist teachings are that we should try our very best to preserve life. The first precept teaches us not to harm. That is the Buddhist teachings. All right. However, as I say that, I have to be mindful that I am saying that as an outsider. I'm not saying that as the father, the mother, or the victim. And he said, there is no way I can understand the pain that the father, the mother, and the victim is going through. So while I say this, he said, I say it with reservation, that ultimately that decision of whether you want to keep that child or not keep that child is entirely up to the family, of which he said, I will not judge as right or wrong, because there is a gray area. So he said, who am I to judge? I am not that girl. I am not the one who is going to suffer for the rest of my life. Neither am I the girl whose education, blah, 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 is going to be disrupted. So he said, I can tell you the principles, but I also understand that the pain psychologically is real. So if you choose to keep, that's fine with me. If you choose to abort, that is also fine with me. And as a Buddhist master, I am in no position to say whether what you did is right or wrong. I tell you, when I heard the Venerable Master say that, I said, this is wisdom. Because in medicine, in Malaysia, for example, abortion is illegal. But if the mental health of the mother is affected, for example, as is obvious in this context, then it is legal. So I hope I have answered your question indirectly, brother or sister, so there is a gray area all right, and I too will not say right or wrong because it's easy as an outsider to pass judgment and I have no wish to pass judgment. Ultimately, the family will have to make that decision and we will respect that decision. Thank you, Mishan. Thank you, Dr. Punya. Next question from Jeanette Ang from BJF. If my physical body can't function anymore and a big burden to my family, is euthanasia considered a suicide and violate the precept, thou shall not kill? Well, there is no such thing as thou shall not kill in Buddha Dharma. All precepts are training rules. They are all sikhapadam, which means a training rule. It is only in theistic religions that say, thou shall not kill. Now, if the Buddha had given us that commandment, then all of us are in big trouble. Sister Janet, you cook fish, you cook chicken, you boil water, you cook veggie, you have killed, I don't know how much. So as long as you live, you're going to kill. So thankfully, the Buddha was wise enough to say, anati pata sikha padam, sikha padam. Okay, that's training rule. Veramani means I undertake. I undertake the training rule to abstain from killing. Panatipata, veramani sikapadam samadhi yami. Okay? Panatipata, harming, killing. Panatipata, veramani, abstain, sikapadam training rule, where samadhi yami, I undertake. Okay, remember it's the other way around. So now, euthanasia, there are only very few countries which allow. Very few. Italy was one of those that just voted last week. Now, and even then, under very, very strict conditions, you cannot anyhow chin tai chin tai euthanize somebody. Very, very strict conditions, but very few countries. So generally, other than those countries in Europe and a few states in America and one or two states in Australia, most countries do not allow Active euthanasia. If you Google, you will know what I mean. Active 
euthanasia means you, the doctor, intentionally give something to terminate the terminally ill patient's life. So very few countries allow that. And that is a bit controversial. Passive euthanasia is doing nothing beyond common sense. That means to say this person has a terminal illness and this person is obviously dying. So pestis euthanasia means the doctor is going to advise the family, please don't incubate, please don't put on dialysis, please don't put on cardiac support because that will only prolong the dying process, maybe another week, and ultimately he dies. So in that sense, we allow the person to have what is called the natural history of the disease. Now, everyone had died in the old days until about 50 years ago from the natural history. It is only around 50 years ago that we started to have processes which can alter the natural history. So that's passive. And passive euthanasia would require common sense and clinical judgment. That means to say, this person is obviously having a terminal illness. For example, some horrendous end-stage cancer. We are not going to ventilate this person for heaven's sake. We will just let the person go naturally. That is passive euthanasia. And that, of course, requires, as I said, clinical judgment. Active euthanasia is a completely different thing. There are only very few countries, as I say, in Europe, one or two states in Australia, I repeat, another few states in America that allows it but even then under very, very rigid regulations, okay? So if you go on the internet, you will see Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh in a question and answer session, whereby someone asked him, a young man asked him about active euthanasia. And his reply was, you have to ask yourself very, very seriously, why are you doing it? Are you truly doing it to relieve the suffering of the person? in which case he said that would be something wholesome, or are you doing it because you are trying to get rid of a problem? Then that is a completely different situation. So Sister Janet, you can look up the internet, you can look up Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, and he had very clearly explained this. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Punya. Next, we have a question from KMBS from Sister Sue Tran. When we grieve on the death of a dear one, the grieving is actually due to our attachment, not so much feeling for the dead. How do we manage our grief? Well, Shu Chen, my dear, as I said, grieving is the price you pay for love. And in this case, attachment. That was what I said in my sharing there. When you truly understand, if you are, for example, someone who is enlightened, then of course you will not grieve because you see the big picture. But until we reach that stage, we see birth and death as two events which begin and end, all right? In reality, of course, it is just two doors. It is not two events which begin and end. And as I said earlier, grieving process is something which everyone unenlightened will go through. You are absolutely correct. It is actually due to attachment. It is what will happen to me, not so much feeling for the dead. So, First, to manage that grief is to understand the Dhamma. Understand the Dhamma. Second, of course, is for Kayana meters and family to share that grief. If it is one person bearing that grief, it's difficult. You might break down. But if you have family members to help, and that's why we always say, oh, don't let the person stay alone. Stay with the person. Or you've got Kayana meters to help, then it is a different thing because you actually make that circle bigger. Because as long as the person is grieving himself, as I said, this is how he sees the world. Everything is covered by the death. But when you have kayanamitas, when you understand the Dhamma, when you have help from relatives, then you are seeing it like that. It is just part of that whole picture. Your grief is still the same size, but now you've got a bigger circle. So, do not condemn someone who is grieving because that is a price we pay for love, our physical love. Pathological grieving is, of course, grieving that has gone on beyond a reasonable period of time associated with depression. And for that, of course, you usually will need psychiatric help and medication. 
But I think that for all of us in this audience, all 400 of us, the thing is to learn the Dhamma now. The thing is to have insight. And then at that time, both if you are the patient or if you are the person attending, it is much easier. Let me put it this way again, using examples. Huh? The brother that I showed you, I told you who insists on six pieces of plywood, he and his wife are very good for this. And he was sick for a long time. So they had adapt, a period of adaptation. So of course, when he passed away, the wife, the daughter, the son-in-law, the grandchildren, of course, they were very grieved. But their acceptance was very rapid because they could understand the Dhamma. And of course, they could also accept it because he has been sick for so long, all right? So for us, I think the most important thing here is to learn that Dhamma well. And as I mentioned many a times, if it is a sudden death, then it is actually very, very difficult. Okay? All right, thank you, please, Thank you, Dr. Punya. Next question from SJBA. If I practice Buddhism on my own and do not have any Kayamitas, what should I do on my deathbed? Why are you alone, brother? As JBA people, please take note, help this brother. He is alone. The Buddha had said, Kayanamitas is not half my spiritual life or one quarter of my spiritual life. Kayanamitas is my entire spiritual life because they keep me on the path. They encourage me. They drag me back on the path and I deviate. And when I fall, they lift me up. So we need Kayanamitas. And unless you are very strong in your understanding and your insight, it is difficult when you are alone. Because when you have pain, when you have distress, you need help. So what can you do on your bath bait if you are alone? Well, it's going to be difficult because you need support from other people at that point in time. Who is going to administer to your needs? You need people to administer to your needs. For example, even if you say, I can afford to go to a ward and have nurses take care of me, that is a very impersonal thing. So you need to have Kayana meters. Now, of course, I'm going to extend this a little bit further. What if one of us get COVID-19? Now, if you get COVID-19, and I said I've seen a few friends with it, it's a very horrendous way to die. A very close friend of mine died from COVID-19. He and his wife are dear friends of me and my wife. Now, when he, get, when he got COVID-19, they had to pack him up and shift him up to another hospital quite far away from JB, because that's the main hospital then for Johor State. And the wife had to be isolated because she was exposed to him. No one could visit him. The wife could only communicate with him on the handphone. No one could visit or talk to him physically. And of course, the poor man passed away. And after he passed away there, no funeral allowed. They had to send a representative up to the hospital to identify and confirm, yes, this is the body, and then the body is immediately cremated. No funeral service allowed. The ashes were brought back a few days later. And of course, you can imagine how traumatic it is for the wife. So now let's put it this way. If that's it, that is one of us. So you'll be alone, even if you have Kayana meters. Your Kayana meters can attend to your wife when she has come out of quarantine. But even during the quarantine period, you can't even attend to your wife beyond the handful. So it is up to our training then. How strong are you in your mind? How well are you to adapt to being alone? And how well can you develop stillness and calmness in that moment? If you are well practiced, after Chinese New Year, I'm going to talk a little bit about simple practices which anyone can do. Then, of course, you're going to handle it much better than someone who is not. All right? Now, you can, of course, put the handphone, run the chants on your handphone. You can record what I said on the handphone just now. I'm sure Brother Willy can clip, clip that out and send it to all of you who want so that you can put it in the handphone and, okay, then you play it and Dr. Wong is saying it to you. But that is not the ideal. The ideal is still you need someone to hold your hand. All right? But let's hope that we have the good 
karma not to be stuck in a situations like that. Back to you, Hui Shan. Thank you, Dr. Punya. Next question from KCBA from Brother Duka Ko. Dr. Punya, what if other religion of brother insists that our parents who just passed away, that he or she has agreed that we have to convert before death? Do we follow their custom of funeral? Well, brother, uh, your question is not alone. Huh? It's actually a, a not uncommon thing that I see, you know. So that's why I said you have to be careful. All right. One important thing is, again, I appeal TBCM, please take the lead, make that card so that I can stick that card there and say, I am a Buddhist. I am a Hahayana Buddhist. Please respect my religion. Then this is not going to be a problem. Because if not, this can be a problem. I have seen this happen in real life. Not once, but many times. So having said that, I have seen people being converted even in coma, you know. Don't ask me how, you know. Suddenly they come out, he's converted. So this becomes very difficult for other family members because you don't want to get engaged into a big quarrel at that point in time. So again, uh, I think Whaley is in TBCM, huh? right, Whaley? So Whaley, please make sure you get that card. There are examples on the internet. I have it from Singapore. I can even send it to you. We don't have to invent the wheel again. We just adapt so that those who are sick carry that card. No questions asked there. That's the card. This is what I state clearly. Now, after having said that, brother, let me assure you, uh, actually the funeral service makes no difference, you know. The funeral service is for the living. The funeral service is to provide closure for the living. And in the event that the deceased has become a hungry ghost, then that is the only realm that the Buddha taught in which that deceased person can benefit from what we offer from the dedication of marriage. If the person has been reborn into a human being or an animal or any other realm, then that person will not benefit from the funeral service. So when we do the funeral service, yes, of course, if the person is in a state whereby the person can understand us, is aware of us, then he or she may benefit. But beyond that, remember the importance of a funeral service is to provide closure for the relatives so that the relatives feel comforted. So, um, in fact, if you have a big quarrel, then it's even going to be worse. Okay? So, now let me put it to you this way. Some time ago, we had someone who was in this situation. So, the family insisted a certain branch of the family insisted that the funeral must be done in this religion. And so they came and saw me. So I said, no problem, go ahead. Don't quarrel. Your father will even be more upset if he's aware. After they've done the service, and another day we do a Buddhist service. Lah. I said, as Ajahn Brahm used to say, you can convert. Then after that, you can tudang saranang gachami again and then reconvert. After all, everything is a nature. All right. Thank you, Hishan. Thank you, Dr. Punya. Uh, next question from Chin. What is your opinion regarding throwing our ashes into the sea as opposed to keeping it in a column burial? Very green. Very, very green. I would say throwing to the sea is a excellent way, first and foremost. Um, nowadays, of course, columbarium not cheap. Huh? My uncle in KL passed away a columbarium when we inquired 30, 40,000 for a little shoebox size columbarium. And there's no guarantee that your subsequent generations are going to take good care of it as well. So, of course, if the family says, well, we want to keep it there so that we can pay respect, etc., etc., fine, put in a column barrier. Uh, even better, you can pay for it yourself. Nowadays, you know you can prepay uh, your funeral service. I hope you're aware. You can prepay the funeral service if you're sick. And, of course, if you wish to throw into the sea, I would say that's very, very green. That's a very green method of disposing. And um, 
Uh, of course, my wife used to laugh that she's seasick, so please don't ever do that to her. It's okay, I said, I promise you I won't do that because she said she gets seasick more. So that's fine, okay? So no problem at all, Brother Chin, um, whether keeping in a columbarium or keeping in the, you know, in Japan, they have the ashes, but they keep the ashes something like a small little grave or in a big Buddha image. So um, all these are options, which to me are really up to the family members. No, no, no right or wrong. Okay. Yes, Huishan. Thank you, Dr. Punya. Next question from Janet M from BGF. In Mahayana, we are taught that at our deathbed, we chant Amitwafo sincerely and no other thought, and they will fetch us into the pure land. Do you agree with this? I'm going to get in trouble by asking, answering this question. So I'm going to again quote the six Patriot Poinang's answer. Okay, the six Za, the six Chan Patriot Poinang was asked this question. You know, the six Patriot Poinang was considered the the point at which. Chan became Chinese. Chan started with Bodhidharma, the first patriot, and then the second, third, fourth, fifth, basically followed what Bodhidharma taught. And Hui Neng, that great giant of a man, was the man who literally made it into what it is today. He was really a brilliant man. You should read the Six Patriot Platform Sutra. And so the sixth patriarch was asked this same question. So I'm not going to answer it. I'm just going to quote you the sixth patriarch's answer. And you can read the Platform Sutra yourself. Again, of course, I'm paraphrasing. I can't possibly tell the exact words. But he was told this. And so he answered, Western pure land, he said. What do you mean by Western pure land? See, for us in China, we look to India, we say that's the West. For people in India, they look to the West, it's another country. So what do people in the West look at as the Western pure land? So he said, first, this concept of Western, Eastern is purely conceptual in the mind. Then the second, he said, you tell me that the Western pure land is si wan ba qian li away. Then, si wan is 10,000. Ba qian is eight. Uh, sorry, si wan, si wan are 10. 10 of 10,000, so 100,000. 100,000. Ba Qian is 8,000, so it's 108,000. All right? And you tell me that if I were to chant, and if my mind is still and my mind is pure, I will be reborn into this pure land. And he's told the man who asked him that question. So now I'm asking Sister Janet. Sister Janet, I can show you the Western Pure Land now. You don't have to die to see it. All you got to do, the Venerable Hui Neng told the person who asked, is to close your eyes. If you tell me in your mind that I have the 10 wholesome practice, you know the 10 wholesome practice and then the 10 unwholesome practice, you can Google it, it's all there. Okay, of a body, speech and mind. And the eight, is the eightfold path, right view, right thoughts, all the way to right stillness. He said, if you are practicing right view, right thoughts, all the way to right stillness, that's the eight, huh? and the 10 wholesome deeds, okay? Then the Western Pure Land is right in you now. But if you are doing the 10 unwholesome deeds, body, speech, mind, unwholesome. And you're following wrong view, wrong thoughts, all the way to wrong stillness. Then the pure land is si wan ba qian li, away from you. So that would be the answer I'm giving because that is the answer that the Venerable Patriot Hui Neng gave. And you can check it out yourself. It's in the Platform Sutra. Okay? 
Thank you, Dr. Punya, and thank you everyone for posting your questions. I hope that some of your doubts are cleared. We shall end the Q&A session here.